Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this video on Ages of Empires, where we will be coming, covering Shamshi Adad, the first of the old Assyrian Empire, and Hammurabi of the first Babylonian Empire. The structure of this is we will go through each empire, sort of biography or covering the rise and fall of each respective empire with the endeavor of finding out what causes empires perhaps even today to fall and furthermore to rise. And then we will also take out a particular ruler from each of the two respective empires, in this case being Shamshi Adad I and Hammurabi, uh, uh, the two empires respectively. And then at the very end, we'll have a comparison in the style of Plutarch's lives between the two leaders to hopefully maybe learn something more about leadership or character, which everyone can bring into their own personal lives as well. So without further ado, we will begin with the old Assyrian Empire and Shamsi, Ad Shamshi Adad the first. So, starting with the old Syrian Empire, so starting with the rise, circa 2025 BCE to 1750 BCE. So the genesis of the old Assyrian Empire can be traced back to the ancient Egyptian city-state of Assur. So we actually covered that previously in the, uh, um, the, the city-state of Assur, which is a major city-state in the region of Sumer. We've also covered Sumer, Sumer civilization more generally. Uh, so Assur is nestled along the banks of the Tigris River in the northern expanse of Mesopotamia, so one of the Mesopotamian civilizations. In terms of the, they consider them the three major ancient civilizations of the region, that's ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia, and the Indus Valley civilization are sort of the trio of ancient civilizations in the region. However, Mesopotamia is sort of divided into multiple empires. And furthermore, even for example, the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian empire has divided into three major periods in which it was an empire. So around 2025 BCE, during the reign of King Shamshi Adad I, who we will cover soon, the Assyrians embarked on a transformative journey that would ultimately reshape the course of early Mesopotamian history. Kim King Shamshi Adad I emerged as a dynamic and visionary leader, driven by a fervent ambition to expand the territorial dominion of Assur. Employing a potent blend of strategic acumen and military prowess, Shamshi Adad embarked on a series of audacious campaigns. With calculated precision, he methodically subjugated a constellation of neighboring city-states, weaving a tapestry of conquests that formed the bedrock of the nascent empire. The annals of his reign are punctuated by names like Ashur, Nineveh, and Ekalatum, each city bearing testament to Shamsi Adad's indomitable spirit and, metal, and the metal of his warriors. These territorial acquisitions fortified the empire's position along the fertile crescent of the Tigris, providing a robust foundation for future expansion. So previously we covered, for example, the Lagash Empire, which was a city-state within the summer region, for example, and it came at one point to encompass some other city-states. But I would say in this case, Assur, due to Shamshi Adad, the first even grew to be larger than the Lagash Empire. However, in a slightly later period. So now moving to the expansion of the, Assyr, of, of the Assyrian Empire, pardon me, circa 1813 BCE to 1761 BCE. So the zenith of the old Assyrian Empire uh, materialized during the reign of Ismay Dagon, the scion of Shamshi Adad I. Buoyed by the strategic groundwork laid by his father, Ishmael Dagan emerged as an architect of imperial grandeur. His reign witnessed an unprecedented surge in territorial aggrandizement as the Assyrian realm transcended geographical confines and inscribed its legacy across the annals of ancient history. To the west, Anatolia yielded to the indomitable might of Ish. Ishmi Dagan's legions, heralding the empire's expansion into the rugged heartland of modern-day Turkey. 
so moving honestly, conquering to the west even further than perhaps the Lagash Empire achieved and the Sumerian civilization some consider it may not even been an, an empire in its own right but nonetheless the, the Assyrian Empire sort of surpassed the, the two and to, uh, uh, this pr pr prodigious phase of territorial acquisition was punctuated by audacious forays into the heart of Babylonia as well, which we will be covering as the next empire, where the empire's influence resonated with profound resonance. In the pinnacle of its power, under the stewardship of Rimush, grandson of Sh Shamshi Adad I, the old Assyrian empire unfurled its dominion from the tranquil so shores of the Mediterranean Sea to the rugged embrace of Zargos, Zargos Mountains. So a huge territorial region, particularly for the time as well, without modern technology. It's one thing to manage an empire with a, with a network of trains, but to manage an empire with only horses or, or cattle or camels, perhaps, that's a, quite a significant achievement. But then on the same point, it's maybe easier to manage if one has access to the, to the, you know, the, the cavalry, for example. This zenith of territorial expanse crystallized the empire's prominence as a paramount force within the ancient Near East. Now moving to the decline and fall, circa 1760 BCE to 1750 BCE. So, yet yeah, within the crescendo of triumphs lay the seeds of impending adversity. The old Assyrian Empire grappled with internal fissures, its once unified core now beset by fractious divisions and burgeoning rivals for the throne. So, sort of internal conflicts, people competing to control the throne. And the, the specter of succession disputes loomed large, sowing discord within the imperial court as well. Externally, the empire faced mounting pressures from neighboring powers eager to challenge its ascended might. The Hittites, having emerged as a formidable, who we will cover, contender to the Anatolian plateau, now cast a watchful eye on the empire's territorial gains. Simultaneously, the resolute Kassites, hailing from the rugged terrain, launched a concerted assault on the empire's domain. So, unlike well, perhaps true for some of the empires we've covered, but not necessarily necessary. There was both internal issues and external threats that caused to its decline and ultimate fall. Around 1750 BCE, a cataclysmic confluence of these internal schisms and external assaults precipitated the irrevocable, irrevocable decline of the old Assyrian Empire. The citadels of Assur and Nineveh once bastions of indomitable power, now bore witness to the ravages of conflict. Cities fell, territories were relinquished, and the heartland around Assur succumbed to occupation. This led to this dark, which called the Dark Age, until Ahur Ubalit, the first king of the Middle Assyrian Empire, began to reign in 1363. So similar to the old Egyptian or Egyptian history, there's sort of a dark age in which we I cannot call it an empire, but we will cover the latter, um, the Middle Kingdom Assyrian Empire eventually. So moving to the legacy of the old Assyrian Empire. So the old Assyrian Empire marked a poignant denouement to an epoch of unparalleled conquest and cultural efflorescence. Although the empire lay in ruins, its legacy endured. The administrative acumen, martial traditions, and cultural heritage forged during its zenith would continue to rever reverberate through the corridors of history. In retrospect, the rise and fall of the old Assyrian empire stands as a testament to the ebb and flow of ancient civilizations, leaving an indelible imprint on the evolving tapestry of human progress. So, I think... It was it climbed through its military prowess and through its centralized government, but of course its centralized government sort of uh, ultimately collapsed as people contested for the throne and there were issues at court. But furthermore, the its military prowess was ultimately over um, defeated by perhaps eventual greater military prowess. Not necessarily better overall, but at least better in the declining period of the old Assyrian Empire. 
So now moving to more detail regarding Shamshi Adad, the first of Assyria, the founding architect of the empire, the leader who we've singled out to learn a little bit about leadership and a little bit more about the old Assyrian empire. So Shamshi Adad, the first, a colossus of ancient Mesopotamian history, emerged as the seminal figure in the genesis of the old Assyrian Empire during the tumultuous 19th century BCE. Hailing from the city-state of Assyr, Shamshi Adad embarked on a journey that would forever transform the destiny of Assyrian civilization. So, starting with his ancestry and early years. So, little known, little is known of Shamshi Adad's early years, shrouded as they are in the midst of antiquity, but he was born into a reign teeming, a region, pardon me, teeming with city-states, that is the region of Summer or Mesopotamia, and he inherited a realm rife with geopolitical rivals. Ascending to the throne of Assur, he was confronted with a fractured landscape wherein the seeds of a unified empire lay dormant. So before him, there was no unified Assyrian state or empire. So moving to his vision and ambition. So from the outset, Shamshi Adad harbored a vision of uniting the disparate city-states under the banner of Assur. Recognizing the untapped potential of his city-state, he embarked on an audacious campaign of territorial conquest. With a disciplined army at his disposal and a keen understanding of military strategy, he set about the task of unification. Moving to uh, the tapestry of his conquest itself, so Shamshi Adad's military campaigns were a testament to his strategic acumen and the mettle of his warriors. City after city fell under the sway of Assyria as Shamshi Adad etched his name into the annals of history. He even had the title King of the Universe, as we have here on the slide. Ashur, Nineveh, and Ekalatun became the bastions of Assyrian dominance, their conquests forming the sinews of a nascent empire. Moving to the architect of the empire, beyond military conquests, Shamshi Adad was a visionary statesman as well. He recognized the necessity of administrative cohesion in governing the burgeoning empire, and Shamshi Adad established a system of governance wherein local governors pledged allegiance to the central authority in Assyr, creating a decentralized yet cohesive administrative framework. So not unlike the Egyptian empire, which was completely centralized, but also, also lost its centralization, which was one of the causes, at least in the old Egyptian empire, and, like, and true for also for the Middle Kingdom, as we've observed as well. But nonetheless, he... Um, Shamshi Adad might have been different in the Egyptian case in that some, he had some local governors and some were pledging allegiance, so slightly more decentralized than the pharaoh or the Egyptian model. Moving to legacy and, of trade and commerce. So Shamshi Adad's reign saw a flourishing of trade and commerce that excluded Assyrian influence far be, or that extended, pardon me, Assyrian influence far beyond its territorial borders. The empire's merchants forged extensive networks, facilitating the exchange of goods and ideas across vast dis distances. Assyria's economic vitality became the cornerstone of its enduring legacy. So, as we've observed with, for example, Lagash and Summer, trade was very important, and even in Egypt as well, or the, in the Indus Valley civilizations, trade was quite significant in this region. And it's also true for the Assyrian Empire that it did Maybe it wasn't necessarily dependent on trade, but it definitely gained much of its strength through trade. And trade can be also a way of dissipating war. Or, for example, if there's a very powerful nearby state and they have a big military, it's probably better to trade with them rather than to block trade and lead to a war. Moving to cultural patronage. patronage. Shamshi Adad's reign was not confined to matters of statecraft alone. He emerged as a patron of culture and learning as well, fostering an environment conducive to intellectual pursuits. Scholars, scribes, and artisans flocked to Assyria, creating a vibrant tapestry of intellectual discourse and creative expression, which we shall cover soon in the content of the slide. Moving to the zenith of power. Under Shamshi Adad's stewardship, the old Assyrian Empire reached its zenith, 
from the tranquil shores of the Mediterranean Sea to the rugged embrace of the Zagros Mountains, Assyria's dom dominion extended across a vast expanse of the ancient Near East. The empire stood as a testament to the indomitable spirit of a leader who had transformed a city-state into an empire. So even under his time, it sort of hit its, uh, its greatest limits, at least in terms of distance. Moving to the enduring legacy, the legacy of Shamshi Adad, I mean, the first reverberates through the corridors of time. His reign laid the foundation upon which subsequent Assyrian rulers would build, propelling the empire to unprecedented heights. Shamshi Adad stands as a paragon of visionary leadership, his imprint etched into the chronicles of ancient empires as the founding luminary of the old Assyrian Empire. So it's perhaps a hypothesis if all of the following, all of his descendants were equally as competent as Shamshi Adad the first, maybe it never would have fallen. But perhaps also I know there's maybe a different skill set between one who founds an empire and one who maintains an empire. So these are all speculations. In summation, Shamshi Adad the first reign represents a zenith of ancient Mesopotamian civilization, but also its founding. His accomplishments as a unifier, military strategist, and statesman continue to inspire generations, underscoring the enduring legacy of a ruler who forged a path towards empire and enduring influence. And I wonder, as we will cover the first Babylonian empire, if it was in some ways inspired by this leader, or at least the old Assyrian empire. So now to look at the content of the slide. So in the top right, we have a map with showing where Assur is, sort of a little bit more north than like Ash or sort of the center of summer, or but still quite nestled into the Mesopotamian region. And we can see the Zargos Mountains, I think I could, the Zargos Mountains to, to the east and all the way to the Mediterranean in which it expanded. Below that, we have a cuneiform payment of loan records. So it's amazing how sophisticated that they had either um, receipts or records of loans at this time written in cuneiform. Below that, they have a drinking vessel in the shape of a head. I wonder what they would have drank out of that. Maybe some, perhaps, um, perhaps an alcoholic beverage, or uh, it's hard to say, but nonetheless, there might be some signification in that. Maybe it was some holy drink to drink out of a vessel. Perhaps that's the head of a god. I'm not quite sure. To the left of that, we have the royal seal of Naram Sin, who is one of the kings of the old Assyrian Empire. To the left of that, we have the royal seal of Ereshim, Ereshom the first, who is also a king. Above that, we have artifacts from and the reconstruction of the Ishtar temple. And Ishtar is goddess Ishtar, so you can see they've got little models of the temple itself. And to the right, what it might have looked like inside. Very incredible how sharp. Um, shapes they are sharp um, cuts in the stone they were able to create to the right we have the king list a list of kings starting with shamshi adad above that we have an image of the goddess ishtar uh, so uh, obviously they were skilled in terms of making these images but quite probably quite religious as well to the left we have a praying man too so quite and further evidence of their religious acumen Moving to the left, we have some ruins from one of their trading colonies. So they so, sort of developed the region through the necessity of trade. And to the left of that, we have Shamshi Adad the first. There is a snake, so it looks like he's taming a snake, but I've sort of had to crop it to make it closer. He's so he's not in the real original one. He's not that close to the snake, but nonetheless, it's perhaps he was some snake tamer. Or perhaps there's some further mythological connection between him and some snake. So in terms of the, um, and also, so this is Shamshi Adad the first and the old Assyrian Empire is the title, and his title is King of the Universe. Can't get much greater than that. Uh, in terms of significant leader, we have Shamshi Adad the first. The empire is the old Assyrian. The period is circa 2025 to circa 1750 BCE. Million square kilometers is 0.15 million square miles 0 0.06 and percent of the world 0 0.11 that's excluding antarctica but it must be noted that much of the world was supposedly not as developed during this time but we will see counter examples for example in mesoamerica capital city assyr thus the name assyrian empire 
government, monarchy. Common languages, Akkadian. So we did cover the Akkadian Empire too, which also came out of Mesopotamia and came to um, uh, came to be the dominant language in the region and evidently the region the language likely of Assyria at the time. As well, they also spoke Sumerian and Amorite. Religion, ancient Mesopotamian, which included such those such as the goddess, goddess Ishtar, and population several hundreds of thousands. It's likely so. Several is kind of an ambiguous term, but I would think it's more than a probably more than a couple. So maybe between three hundred to seven hundred thousand. It's a pretty big range, but it's hard to give a specific note because um, this is so long ago, almost, oh, over four thousand years ago. So that is Shamshi Adad I and the Old Assyrian Empire, and we will talk more about the leader and the Old Assyrian Empire in the comparison with Hammurabi and the First Babylonian Empire. So in terms of the first lady, with the rise and fall of the First Babylonian Empire, so the First Babylonian Empire, also known as the Amorite Dynasty, which we note was one of the languages, one of the more le less dominant languages in the Assyrian Empire, but it became to be one of the more dominant ones here. Also known as the Amorite Dynasty, emerged as a significant power in ancient Mesopotamia around the 19th century BCE. Its rise to prominence and subsequent fall marked a pivotal, pivotal epoch in the annals of human civilization. So starting with its rise, 1894, or circa 1894 BCE to 1500, 1595 BCE. So starting with the Amorite ascendancy. So the ascendance of the Amorites, a Semitic people originating from the West, catalyzed the formation of the first Babylonian Empire. The Amorite tribe tribes gradually infiltrated the Fertile Crescent. So there's a great book, uh, it's called Guns, Germs, and Steel, and it shows that the m most of the, I think it's, well, the majority of domesticated animals came from this Fertile Crescent. So they were far above technologically, and because they had so many domesticated animals, they could produce larger populations. So going back to how much of the world they controlled, they controlled at least a significant amount of the domesticated or um, developed in terms of domestication um, region. But nonetheless, the Amorite tribes gradually infiltrated the Fertile Crescent, culminating in the establishment of the city-state of Babylon as a regional power center. Supposedly, this is later after the Tower of Babel um, in the Old Testament, but perhaps some people say that maybe it was even Tower of Babel perhaps came after, and some people say it never happened. But nonetheless, Babylon was has is a city that has had existed for a long time, but until the infiltration of the Amorites, it was um, it was not a, a regional power center, or at least at the time, pardon me, at the time the Amorites went to it, that it was not a regional power center. Perhaps because so other city states like such as Assur, Lagash, if you can see the map in the top right here, and the Ur were also were more dominant cities at the time, but with the coming of the Amorites, they brought Babylon into dominance. So moving to Hammurabi's ascension, circa 1792 BCE to 1750 BCE. So the, apo the apothesis of the empire transpired under the reign of Hammurabi, often hailed as Babylon's greatest ruler. As that, thus, we will cover him with a specific biography. Ascending to the throne in 1792 BCE, Hammurabi embarked on an ambitious campaign of consolidation and expansion. Moving to the Code of Hammurabi, very famous legal code, circa 1754 BCE, which would make him, I believe, 48 years old, if these dates are correct. Hammurabi's most enduring legacy lies in the codification of laws known as the Code of Hammurabi. This legal corpus etched into the into a, a steel constituted a seminal jurisprudence, jurisprudential milestone addressing matters of civil, criminal, and economic law. So one of the first civil codes, but as we noted, there were some before, but probably the most famous or the most well-known ancient civil code. And as we know, civil 
law, as we covered, the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, civil law differs from common law in that every civil law is based off a civil code, so codified laws. They were not practicing common law in ancient Babylon. But it did cover, so there's also a civil dispute, which are between people, but this civil law more generally covers civil, which is disputes between people, criminal, which is people and the state, and economic law as well. Moving to territorial expansion, Hammurabi's rule witnessed a fervent pursuit of territorial expansion. Babylon's dominion extended from the alluvial plains of Mesopotamia to the fertile terrains of summer, encompassing key city-states like Ur, Uruk, and Larsa, and also Lagash as well. And, but we've covered summer in the summer civilization episode as well. As well. Ur, which is one of the major city-states as well, and Larsa, which was also we covered as well. Moving to the zenith of power, circa 1750 BCE to 1595 BCE, starting with administrative reforms. So Hammurabi's governance was characterized by a meticulous approach to administration. He appointed officials to oversee various facets of the empire, ensuring a cohesive framework, administrative framework. Moving to his cultural flourishing, so the zenith of the first Babylonian empire heralded a period of cultural efflorescence. Scholars, scribes, and artisans congregated in Babylon creating a vibrant intellectual and artistic milieu. As we saw with the old Assyrian Empire, because it became so powerful, it sort of became a center place for a lot of artists to come and artisans, scholars and scribes. So the same is evidently true with the first Babylonian Empire because it was the capital of the empire. A lot of these artists congregated there, but also because it was reaping economic rewards by being the capital, it was also more made more sense for artists and artisans to go there. Moving to diplomacy and alliances, Hammurabi's diplomatic overtures solidified Babylon's regional preeminence. Alliances were forged with neighboring powers contributing to an era of relative stability and prosperity. So, unlike perhaps some other empires, which we will cover, but not necessarily the previous ones, this empire was not formed solely through military conquest, but perhaps even more so through, uh, through alliances forged with neighboring city-states. But also this creates a more decentralized government. Moving to its de the decline and fall of the first Babylonian Empire, circa 1595 BCE to 1155 BCE, starting with the Kassite infiltration, circa 1595 BCE. The empire faced external pressures from the Kassites, a mountainous people from the Zargos region, so the Zargos Mountains in the east. In 1595 BCE, they breached Babylon's defenses, ultimately leading to the establishment of the Kassite dynasty. Moving to Kassite rule and Assyrian incursions, circa 1595 to 1155 BCE. So the Kassite dynasty, while preserving aspects of the Babylonian culture, presided over a period of relative decline. Meanwhile, the resurgent Assyrian Empire, which we previously covered, began encroaching on Babylonian territories. So the Assyrian Empire sort of has a resurgence and comes to threaten the Babylonian Empire once again. Although it was perhaps the, the Babylonian Empire that was in the decline of the first Assyrian, of the old Assyrian Empire that originally contributed to its fall, its first fall. Moving to the legacy of the, Babyl the First Babylonian Empire, despite its eventual dissolution, the First Babylonian Empire left an indelible or unparalleled print on the tapestry of human history. Its cultural, legal, and administrative contributions endured, influencing subsequent empires and civilizations in the ancient Near East. Thus, the rise and fall of the First Babylonian Empire encompassed epochs of territorial expansion, cultural cultural zenith, and geopolitical shifts. Its legacy resonates through the corridors of history, a testament to the enduring impact of an empire that once held sway over the cradle of civilization. So it's sort of fascinating that these people that came from the West came to lead Babylon and sort of 
turned it into an empire, ultimately ruled over other states, and then were ultimately sort of, well, they had that power once again taken from them. But in, the, in doing so, they created the legal code that, although perhaps other city-states, as we covered previously, might have come up with legal codes first, it is the Code of Hammurabi that is most referenced in terms of as the first legal code. I remember my first law course in high school even, the first thing we mentioned was even well, long before the Code of Justinian was the Code of Hammurabi. But there were others around, but the Code of Hammurabi is known to be the, the most recognized old civil code. So in now to a detailed, more detailed biography of Hammurabi of Babylon, the architect of law and empire. Hammurabi, the sixth king of the first Babylonian dynasty, ascended to power in 1792 BCE in a region teeming with city-states vying for dominance. His reign marked a transformative era in Mesopotamian history as he would rise to become the most celebrated ruler of the first Babylonian empire. Starting with his early life in extension, Hammurabi was born into the royal family of Babylon, a city-state that had been gradually, gradually rising in prominence. Though details of his early years are scarce, it is evident that he inherited a realm with untapped potential. Ascending to the throne at a young age, Hammurabi was entrusted with the weighty task of consolidating and expanding Babylon's dominion. So as we can see on the slide, we have him as the sixth ruler, but he's the first major ruler, and that's because he's sort of the one that formalized it into an empire, but we can date back the Babylon. The city of Babylon is a, a, somewhat of an empire from back to Suma Abum or Su Abu. Moving to the Code of Hammurabi, as previously mentioned, Hammurabi's reign uh, is immortalized chiefly through his codification of laws, known as the Code of Hammurabi, comprising 282 edicts etched in a stella of black diorite. This legal corpus addressed a wide array of matters, from criminal justice to commerce and family law. It established a system of justice that sought to uphold social order and equity. So once again, mentioning it's both got the public law component in that it's between the individual and the state, but also the civil component, which is between peoples, but it's still called civil code. Nonetheless, so pardon me for the terminology, but I did not choose these. The code reflected Hammurabi's vision as a just and harmonious society where the powerful were held accountable and the rights of the vulnerable were safeguarded. So very sort of forward thinking at the time. The principle of an eye for an eye remains one of the most enduring aspects of Hammurabi's legacy. An eye for an eye, as I believe it was Gandhi said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. But at this time, it was really a revolutionary invention or creation. Moving to Hammurabi's territorial expansion, Hammurabi recognized that to solidify Babylon's influence, he needed to expand its territorial reach. His reign witnessed a series of meticulously planned military campaigns that saw Babylon's dom dominion extend across the alluvial plains of Mesopotamia. Key city-states such as Ur, Uruk, and Larsa, where we covered the Larsa Empire, fell under Babylonian control. As we can see on the map here, Lar Larsa is there. Um, um, Ur is there as well, and Uruk is there too, so I can see that they're, they're pretty close, but nonetheless, Babylon is a bit more north and to the west of it, but also, ultimately they got threatened from the Sarkos Mountains to the east, and also the Assyrians from Assyr, which is also a bit more north. Moving to terror, uh, pardon me, so Hammurabi's military campaigns were characterized by strategic acumen and diplomatic finesse, so twofold. He doesn't just use the sword, he also knows how to use the carrot. I, pardon me, the, the, the metaphor is the carrot and the stick. So he doesn't just use the stick, he also knew how to use the carrot. He forged alliances with neighboring powers and utilized a well-trained army, ensuring a relatively stable and secure empire. So at least they were well trained, something that maybe not necessarily other, the other city-states were prepared for. But many of these other city-states like Larsa and Ur and Lagash and Assyr had a history of warfare. So it's, they were evidently Babylon, perhaps, or under Hammurabi, more 
effectively trained their soldiers or perhaps were motivated for, for some reason they, they won these military campaigns. And if they could not win, they often won through negotiation or alliances. Moving to Hammurabi's administrative reforms, beyond military conquests, Hammurabi was a shrewd administrator. He recognized the importance of an efficient bureaucracy to govern such a vast empire. Hammurabi appointed officials to oversee various aspects of the administration, from tax collection, collection to infrastructure development. I saw once it was written that until really the United States, tax collection rates were very low, so don't think that everyone here was paying their taxes, but nonetheless, there was some form of tax collection into infrastructure and development. And obviously, the United Kingdom and the taxation has existed from in these 2000 BCE, but nonetheless, I saw the observance that tax collection was very hit and miss throughout history. But nonetheless, to be sophisticated enough to have tax collection is very impressive. Furthermore, to have tax collection, there must be some sort of private industry. Unlike, for, for example, as I imagine in ancient Egypt, everyone sort of worked for the pharaoh. Everyone was sort of a completely bureaucratic state. You wouldn't need to have taxation unless you had private businesses. But I think that's, that's an exaggeration. I think there were still private businesses within ancient Egypt, but probably to a lesser degree. But as you have more private businesses, there's more necessity of tax or more reason for tax. Oh, or just it's more suitable, perhaps, for example, if everyone's a government employee, they just take it out of the paycheck and you don't really need a sophisticated tax structure. His administrative reforms extended to matters of economic policy, which was even covered in the Code of Hammurabi, where he implemented measures to stimulate commerce and trade. Hammurabi's governance was marked by a keen awareness of the interconnectedness of economic prosperity and political stability. So that is very uh, fascinating observance, which is which is makes very much sense as we saw as we'll eventually see in the Nazi Empire that sort of political instability caused that sort of visceral rise of the Nazi Party, and nonetheless, uh, in a, a, a people who have economic prosperity and economic security have have lesser need to go to radical uh, political um, ambitions. Moving to cultural flourishing of Hammurabi. Hammurabi's reign was not confined to matters of statecraft alone. He was a patron of learning and culture, fostering an environment conducive to intellectual pursuits. Scholars, scribes, and artists flocked to Babylon, creating a vibrant intellectual milieu. So it's important that Hammurabi recognized the importance of having arts, and as I've mentioned in previous episodes, but if you have not seen previous episodes, having arts not only creates pride for the people, but maybe even respect for from other opposing forces. The architectural achievements of Hammurabi's era are a testament to the empire's flourishing cultural landscape. Palaces, temples, and other grand structures adorned the cities, reflecting the opulence and sophistication of Babylon, Babylonian society. So in almost in most metrics, Babylon was a very impressive city-state from, from the arts to the military prowess to law to economy to tax. It was very sophisticated. And this is in uh, almost, almost 4,000 years ago. Moreover, Hammurabi's vision of a centralized, administratively efficient state became a template for subsequent empires. The Babylonian Empire under Hammurabi stands as a testament to the transformative power of visionary leadership. Thus, Hammurabi's reign represents a zenith of ancient Mesopotamian civilization. A zenith, because there's been multiple civil um, zeniths, as we covered, for example, Lagash, Larsa, um, the Assyrian, um, some are more generally, but I think at least before I had begun this research, I did know about Babylon far before and Hammurabi far before many, perhaps many of these other city states. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the greatest. For example, the Code of Hammurabi, I don't know why necessarily people teach so much, it's put so much evidence, uh, emphasis on the Code of Hammurabi. Perhaps it's because it's more extensive. I think 283 edicts is perhaps longer um, and therefore more, and perhaps there's better documentation. So, But nonetheless, it did draw from the existing legal codes created in the region. But nonetheless, it has 
the, the, the first Babylonian Empire is, is a, a must study. Uh, and, and under uh, his accomplishments as a lawgiver, military strategist, and statesman continue to inspire generations, underscoring the enduring legacy of a ruler who forged a path towards justice and civilization. So that is the fascinating Hammurabi, and he is, has the title King of the Four Corners of the World, which is, uh, as they said, the four corners as they knew it at the time, but four corners is is all encompassing because corners there's only so um, basically it says it's like saying the entire world but um as we saw shamshi had died was the first was king of the universe so um but nonetheless they were both could be seen as synonymous so now to move to the content of the slide they want to talk a bit more about hammurabi and the first babylonian empire in Pardon me, my laptop died, but um, we are continuing. So moving to the content of the slide. So in the top right, we have the map of the area in which the first Babylonian empire was. So we have Babylon sort of in the center-ish of the, of the map we have here. To the south and east, we have Lagash and Larsa, which are two city-states that ultimately became empires that we covered. Ur was also a major city-state as well. Uh, Assur was a bit to the north. We have to the right the Zargos Mountains, which eventually the threats sort of came. And the, the far to the west, we have the Mediterranean Sea. Below that, we have a hero fighting winged demons. So this is something that seems to be somewhat unique to the first Babylonian empires that they would make sort of a lot of their art on cylinders. And here, I'm not, I'm not. I doubt they had winged demons at the time, so perhaps it was sort of a uh, some sort of creature that they feared, at least through myth. But I think the, uh, something we can definitely take away is that they do admire heroism, which would have given inspired sort of confidence, perhaps, or motivated soldiers on the battlefield to have heroes. So, for example, this hero was able to fight winged demons, therefore I should be able to fight in this battle quite courageously. Below that and to the right, we have a devotion scene. Also, this is artworks, once again, on a cylinder-like shape. And here it's a group of people showing devotion, which is also seems to be a very key theme within the first Babylonian empire. To the left, we have Hammurabi in worship. It's important to note that if Hammurabi himself was engaged in worship or quite religious, I think it would be important or sort of a great symbol for the rest of the population to also be you know, um, to prioritize worship and religion. To the left, we have the list of kings. I'm not certain if this is written in Akkadian, which was the official language of the first Babylonian empire, or Sumerian, which was a common literary language. So my guess is most likely it's written in Sumerian, but it also could be written in Amorite, in which, because it was the Amorite people that ultimately came to lead Babylon and the Babylonian empire. Above that, we have a full list of the kings of the first Babylonian Empire, starting with Sumu Abu, or Sumu Abu, uh, but it was Hammurabi who was the sixth leader of the first Babylonian Empire, who's considered the first major ruler and the point where we can really call it a formal empire. And there were some other following, one, two, three, four rulers after him, and the last ruler of the first Babylonian Empire at the time of its fall was Samsu Ditana. To the left, we have the Code of Hammurabi, also, I believe, on a cylinder-like figure. I can see in the front it's cylindrical-like. It could be a half-cylinder, perhaps, and something I would like to see, eventually, the Code of Hammurabi. And it's important to note, so the code is written on this cylinder-like shape. And above it, on the top, we have we have Hammurabi receiving a royal insignia, insignia from Shamash, or Marduk. Um, so I, I believe these are two different gods, but I know a bit more about Marduk. I've actually heard from uh, Jordan Peterson, who is a controversial figure, and it's uh, completely okay if you dislike him. Um, nonetheless, I, I don't agree with everything he says, but nonetheless, he has some fascinating things with regards to Mesopotamian religion, and Marduk seemed to be kind of the ultimate king of the gods, and he had many eyes around his head. So looking at the image, it looks as though he's got some cylindrical things, so maybe it's Marduk, or maybe it's Shamash, or perhaps, pardon me for not being an expert on Babylon, ancient Babylonian religion, or perhaps Shamash or Marduk are the same, but I think they're two different. But, um, and I think the guess is that it's Shamash, because I don't necessarily see eyes on his head. 
To the left, we have the Code of Hammurabi on a clay tablet. I think this is important to know because perhaps this is likely how they passed around the laws on clay tablets. So maybe they didn't have papyrus or paper at the time, but nonetheless, it was important to pass around the laws and make it generally, um, generally read. And to the left, we have an image, a closer up image of Hammurabi and sort of what he might have looked like, perhaps. And, um, and I believe in this image also he's receiving something from a god as well. So at least Hammurabi supposedly is some sort of, and I think maybe it's, maybe it's sort of analogous to Moses who received gods, the Ten Commandments directly from God, which would give them strength to be accepted. But he was king anyways, so I think they had to be accepted anyways. But it seems that Hammurabi was believed to, or proposed to have some kind of connection, personal connection with the gods. Pardon me for my fan on my computer, it died, so now it has to work up. Um, now in terms of the information regarding the first Babylonian empire, starting with significant leader, Hammurabi, empire, first Babylonian, period, circa 1894, with the Samu Abum or Su Abu to circa 1595 BCE of Samsu Ditana. Million square kilometers, 0 0.25 million square miles, 0 0.1, which percent of the world 0 0.11, so a little bit larger than the old Assyrian Empire, and this excludes uh, excludes Antarctica, so still significant, but as we mentioned earlier, this is where most of the domesticated animals, so at least it was most of the supposed um, developed or ancient world. Capital, Babylon, hence the name, the first Babylonian empire. And government, monarchy. Common language, Akkadian, which was because after the Akkadian rule, many of these city-states came to speak Akkadian and know as the official language. Sumerian was likely the literary language, hence perhaps the Code of Hammurabi or the List of Kings might have been written in Sumerian. Um, I, you know, I would like, if somebody's a master linguist in these areas, I'd really like to connect with them. Or, Am and Amorite was also an important language because the people who came to rule Babylon were of Amorite descendants. Religion, Babylonian, which included perhaps Shamash and or Marduk. Population, several hundreds of thousands to over a million, so a little bit larger than the old Assyrian Empire too. Several, once again, an ambiguous term, but it could be between more than a couple, so maybe 300 to 700, but our range covers to over a million, so maybe between 300 to maybe 1.2 million. But nonetheless, it probably significantly changed over time. By the time Samsu Titana came and its ultimate decline, its population was a little bit smaller, and Sam Sumu Abum, or Su Abu, was probably smaller, but maybe in the time of Hammurabi, it was maybe, oh, maybe over a million, and maybe well over a million. So that is the content of the slide of Hammurabi, the first Babylonian empire. He is also has the title, King of the Four Corners of the World. So by saying four corners, what shape has a corner? A square, so four corners is the full square. Maybe they believed in a flat earth at the time, but nonetheless, King of the Four Corners of the World, to compare him with Shamshi Adad, King of the Universe, is really quite similar, and I think it would be um, uh, cynical to say that Shamshi Adad the first had a better title than Hammurabi, king of the universe, versus king of the four corners of the world. They're both the entire world. But supposedly Shamshi Adad, king of the universe, that might include the celestial too, whereas Hammurabi also supposedly interacted with or gained his royal insignia from the gods. But we will talk about that more in our comparison between Shamshi Adad the first king of the universe, and Hammurabi, king of the four corners of the world. So starting with their background and ascension, starting with Shamshi Adad I, circa 1813 BCE to 1781 BCE. So Shamshi Adad I, born in Assyr, was an Assyrian ruler known for his military conquests and administrative reforms. He ascended to the throne around 1813 BCE, inheriting a city-state on the cusp of transformation. His reign was marked by a territorial expansion and the establishment of a burgeoning empire. Comparing that to Hammurabi, who lived from 1810 BCE to 1750 BCE, so they actually lived during the same time even. 
starting with Hammurabi, born in Babylon, was the sixth king of the first Babylonian dynasty. He assumed the throne in 1792 BCE. Um, so, but he ascended to the throne. So he ascended to the throne a little bit after uh, Shamshi Adad, which makes sense because the Babylonian Empire came a bit after the Assyrian Empire. Inheriting a city-state with ambitions of unification and expansion. Hammurabi's reign was characterized by a judicious blend of military conquests, administrative reforms, and cultural achievements, and also legal um, implementation and creation. So perhaps Hammurabi was significantly inspired or influenced by Shamshi Adad I. Moving to territorial expansion and empire building, starting with Shamshi Adad I. So his military, he was a military strategist by par excellence. He embarked on a relentless campaign of conquest, annexing neighboring territories like Ashur, Nineveh, and Ekkalatun. His audacious expansionist policies integrated disparate regions into a cohesive empire, establishing Assyria as a dominant power in the region. Hammurabi's reign saw a calculated pursuit of territorial expansion as well through a combination of military conquests and diplomatic alliances, so, but they both engaged in diplomatic alliances, but perhaps uh, Hammurabi is more, um, uh, more noted for, but I think Shamshi Adad might have been equally, if not better, if not worse, at um, forming alliances. He solidified Babylon's influence, and his campaigns brought cities like Ur, Uruk, and Larsa, Larsa was previously covered as well, the, dynasty of Ur under the Babylonian control, culminating in the establishment of a formidable empire. Moving to administrative reforms, so Shamshi Adad I undertook the imperative of centralized governance. He established an efficient bureaucracy that streamlined governance and facilitated cultural exchange within the empire. This administrative framework allowed for local autonomy while maintaining allegiance to the central authority in Assyria. So they also had these governors too, which perhaps maybe facilitated its ultimate decline as they contested the throne. Moving to Hammurabi, Hammurabi's reign witnessed a cohesive, comprehensive overhaul of administration. So he was the sixth in line. He appointed or sixth to hold the throne, but ultimately created the first formal leader of the empire. He appointed officials to oversee various facets of the empire, ensuring a cohesive administrative framework. Hammurabi's code of laws serving as a unifying legal corpus, addressing matters of civil, criminal, and economic law. So having this formalized legal code, which in particular had the public component, which is between the individual and the state, definitely solidified and strengthened his empire. But the civil law also supposedly, according to Montesquieu, he says to master the civil law, the, to master the spheres between people is really the, the effect of the authoritarian state, but to leave the political up to sort of arbitration. Moving to military strategy, Shamshi Adad I was a military tactician known for his dynamic approach to conquest. His campaigns were marked by a strategic acumen and tactical flexibility allowing him to conquer neighboring city-states and expand Assyrian influence. Hammurabi employed a methodical military strategy. While his conquests were no less audacious, he combined military might with diplomatic finesse, forming alliances with neighboring powers. This approach contributed to the stability and longevity of the empire. Moving to cultural contributions, Shamshi Adad I, under his patronage, Assyria became a beacon of intellectual achievement. Scholars and artisans flocked to the city, fostering a vibrant intellectual and artistic milieu. This cultural flourishing was complemented by architectural marvels and attested by the empire's burgeoning prosperity. As for Hammurabi, Babylon under Hammurabi's reign witnessed a cultural renaissance. The city became a hub of learning, with scholars, scribes, and artisans flourishing. Hammurabi's code of laws, a seminal achievement, addressed a wide array of legal matters and remains one of the most enduring aspects of his legacy. But it also go governed over, or ruled over economic and civil disputes too, so it probably helped facilitate greater trade and productivity amongst the people. Moving to legacy and impact, 
Shamshi Adad I reign laid the foundation upon which subsequent Assyrian rulers would build, propelling the empire to unprecedented heights. He remains an exemplar of visionary leadership, his imprint etched into the annals of ancient empires as the founding luminary of the Assyrian Empire. Hammurabi's legacy endures as one of the most remarkable rulers in ancient history. So I noted I did know about Hammurabi before I knew about Shamshi Adad. That doesn't necessarily mean he was the greater of the two leaders. His code of laws laid the groundwork for the development of legal systems across civilizations. The principles of equity, justice, and accountability embodied the code embodied in the code continue to resonate through the quarters of time. For example, the eye for an eye principle, which is often now considered an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind, is no more popular, but nonetheless still influences decision-making today. Thus, Shamshi Adad I and Hammurabi were visionary leaders who left unparalleled imprints on the ancient Near East. While they hailed from different empires and had distinct approaches to governance, both were instrumental in shaping the course of ancient Mesopotamian civilization. Their contributions in military conquests, administrative reforms, and cultural achievements continue to inspire generations. So they both came from powerful families, which makes them quite similar. They were both contemporaries, perhaps. Hammurabi learned something from Shamshi Adad first. They were both great in terms of military conquest. Perhaps they were, they were both great in creating strong administrative estates. Perhaps Hammurabi engaged in more um, Creating alliances, but I think the same can be said of Shamsi Adad the first. But Hammurabi's co legal code, the Hammur code of her Hammurabi, is more well known. I'm not aware of a legal code of Shamsi Adad the first, but legal codes did exist in other neighboring city states in the Mesopotamian region. So it's not impossible to believe that Shamsi Adad also created the legal code. But then the follow-up question would be. If Shamshi Adad the first also created a legal code, why is it less known than Hammurabi's? Perhaps I hypothesize because it's much longer, including 283 edicts. So thank you very much for that. Pardon for the minor break. My power ran out, and pardon me for the fan that turned on. But thank you very much for watching this video. Oh, and Shamshi Adad, the first king of the universe and of the old Assyrian Empire, and Hammurabi, king of the four corners of the world, which I think both are synonymous, of the first the first Babylonian empire. So thank you very much for the support. This is Cashcroft TV, and I hope you continue to do so. Thank you very much.